<clears throat> first one here. How is it that I prayed for a sick person, they get healed, and then the very thing I commanded to leave them will oftentimes come on me, and I will have the same symptoms that they described. Then I have to command it off myself, and it seems harder to get rid of. Good question. That is, I mean, very typical. Now, <clears throat> part of that comes, and I'm not saying every time, but part of that understanding that people have with that is that uh, there used to be a book out, well, it's still out, called uh, Intercessor with Reese Howell. And <clears throat> people really got into that. And, and at one point, he actually described when he was interceding for people that the symptoms they had would come on to him. And his understanding was that he was entering into their sufferings, right? Now, that is totally wrong. I mean, it is... Now, Reese Howell was a godly man, you understand? And I'm not putting him down. I'm just saying he was wrong uh, in, in that area because... If it's not right to be on them, it's not right to be on the person praying for them, right? And we don't enter into their sufferings and sickness. Jesus bore that, right? Matter of fact, if you, when we get into healing and the atonement, the very words used for that Jesus bore our sins and our sicknesses literally means he bore sins and sicknesses and diseases as a punishment for us so that we don't have to bear them. I mean, that's the whole idea of what Jesus did. So, um, never put up with that, right? Now, people say, well, why does that happen then? Isn't it, isn't it God let me feel what these people feel? No, it's not. It is, and, and again, it, the reason the church didn't understand this is because the church didn't understand warfare, okay? That's called retaliation. That's what's happening. You are hitting that devil, and it says, oh, oh, for instance, you come up on a fight with two people. And you got this bully that's got this other person down. And the bully's just, you know, wailing on this other person. And then you walk up and you kick the bully in the side and say, hey, get up and leave him alone. Okay, what do you think the bully's going to do? He's going to turn on you. He's already whooped this person. And now you're challenging him, so he's going to come after you. That's all that's taking place here. See, once you understand that, and you go, okay. So now when that's coming up, because what the devil does is, again, the, the devil has no authority. He has ability, but no authority. Okay, because of that, he has to get you convinced to let him beat on you, right? Now, he uses religion to convince you that his attack on you or your suffering is God's will. Because he knows if he can convince you it's God's will, you won't fight it. You understand? But once you understand it's not God's will and that it is an attack of the enemy, then you have to stand strong against it, resist it, which is what he says to do is to resist the devil. And when you do that, then you can beat him. But if you don't think it's the devil doing it and you think it's God trying to, you know, show you compassion for this person or something like, well, you know, God let me go through this because now I sure have compassion for people that are going through this thing. Okay, that, that's not God, all right? Now, I'm not saying you can't learn some things. I'm not saying you can't, you know, experience some things. But I'm saying, I didn't have to lose a child to have compassion for people that, that lost children. You understand? And, and you don't, because uh, if that's true, then Jesus never had compassion. Right? Because there's no evidence that he ever experienced any of those things. And yet we know for sure that he had compassion because that's how he healed people. A matter of fact, most people said, well, see, now Jesus... You know, the Spirit of God led Jesus to heal everybody that he was led to heal. You can't find that in the Bible. There's nothing in the New Testament that says that. Okay? What it says is Jesus was moved with compassion. Right? It didn't say, because Jesus healed multitudes. Right? There were multitudes of people that came to him. And he healed them all. So, the, the Spirit of God did not lead him to heal each individual person. You have to understand... And, and when we get into healing and atonement again, you'll see this. Most people's problem is that they try to, they believe that God has to okay every individual healing. In other words, okay, God, you want this one healed? And God says yes or no, and he flips a switch that lets power come or not. That is not what happens, all right? Essentially, the best way I can say it is this. When Jesus was on the whipping post... And it's because the Bible says, by his stripes were healed. Okay? When he was on that whipping post, and, and, and it says that he bore our sicknesses and our diseases. Now, that is 
in common language today, in legal language, that would be called a class action suit. All right? In other words, you, it, for instance, in um, all you have to do, you see these things on ads on TV all the time. <clears throat> you know, if you took this medicine or this pill or this drug and you experienced this, then you may be, you know, <clears throat> in line for some money. Well, the re only reason they're doing that is because they have filed a class action suit or they're trying to. And to get a class action suit, you have to get enough people involved, right, to show that it was widespread. Now, if it was just you and you go to court, now if you go to court against some big corporation, you're probably going to lose. Mainly because they got money, they got lawyers, and they can just wear you out, okay? But if you can get enough people to prove that enough people were injured by this product, now it's not just an individual case here and there, now it's a whole group and it takes on the form of a class action suit, which is a much higher situation. And once, now understand this, in a class action suit, they don't care who you are. Who you are, what you've done, all that, they don't care any of that, okay? All they care is, can you prove that you were injured by this situation, this person, or this drug? And if, they, if you can prove that, you're included. Isn't that right? That's what Jesus did. <clears throat> when he said in Psalm 103, <clears throat> forget not all his benefits, who, heal, or who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. He is saying, if you have been in sin, if you have been affected by sin, okay, that's pretty much everybody, right, okay? or if you have been affected by disease, right, then you are included in the class action suit that Jesus is going to bring to bear at a future time. All right? So, it doesn't, see, that's the thing. We keep thinking that, well, this is an individual. God is looking at that individual saying, you healed, you not healed. You deserve it. You don't deserve it. You wait. This is for my glory. All these lies that have been built up in the church, right? Most doctors, now understand, I'm not really pro-medical profession, okay? More people die every year from misdiagnosis than died in the entire Vietnam War, okay? So there's a lot of things, and admitted, hopefully, most of the time it's accidental, but, okay, people still die. So I'm not, you know, I'm not anti-medical, I'm just not pro-medical, right? I have found a better way, and I don't need that, okay? Now, I will say this. As a whole, most doctors are more in line with God's will than most preachers. You understand? Because doctors have set themselves against sickness and disease, and they are trying their best, okay, you know, <laughs> give or take, <clears throat> they're, they're trying to eradicate sickness and disease. Right? Whereas most preachers are not trying to eradicate sickness and disease, they end up trying to use it somehow to either whip people, you know, God's people down or use it somehow to make an excuse about something, right? So they're really not interested in eradicating it, okay? Now, over the years, some things are starting to change, but it's still not totally changed yet, right? So I'm not, um, you know, not going to get off on that too far, but, but I want you to understand that we have to set ourselves against sickness. and We have to be against what Jesus was against. All right? And we have to be for what Jesus was for. We never see Jesus putting sickness on anyone. We never see Jesus saying, no, you keep your disease, this is good. Okay? Even in John 9, and again, remember, uh, punctuation, chapter divisions, all that stuff is not from God. Okay? The scriptures were from God. Chapter divisions, verse numbers, all that was man-made. So don't, don't automatically read a chapter. Read the, the line of thought. And which means sometimes you have to jump across a chapter. Okay? And read the whole context and not just pieces. And if you read that, when you go to John 9, matter of fact, go there real quick because I, I do want to bring this up and then we're going to move right into what we kind of get right back on schedule here. Because the other part of that question here, in a minute, or, or another question actually goes into <clears throat> about sickness and disease, and it goes into the Old Testament, and I'm going to point some things out. Now, 
go to John. We'll start. Yeah. <clears throat> Might as well start one, verse one. John nine one. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Now notice he didn't say God led him to the man. It said he just saw him. Right? And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, you understand all the punctuation that's going on here. Now, he said, verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work, and as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, notice he equated being the light of the world with opening the eyes of the blind. Right? Now, he said, I'm the light of the world. But then he turned around and said, you are the light of the world. Right? He said, you don't put a light, under a candle under a bushel. You put it on top of a hill where everybody can see it. Right? And say, so our problem is we've been taught, don't do anything in public. You do anything in public, it's for show. You're trying to show off, right? But Jesus said, let your light... He said, you're the light, right? And when he related light, he related it to healing the blind, right? He didn't relate it to passing out tracts or witnessing or knocking on doors. You understand that? He related light to healing the sick. And he said, let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And th what that says is, you don't do this in secret. Right? You don't pull them off over the side. You know, when you're in Kmart, you don't pull them in the middle of the clothing rack so nobody else can see you. Alright? You do it publicly. You do it boldly. You do it out where everybody can see it. Now, you don't have to make a show out of it. And you don't make a show out of them. Right? <clears throat> when I was in Malaysia, recently there was a a lady, a lady came to me and said, my niece or somebody, I don't remember who it was, but it was kin to her, said she's seven years old. She has scoliosis. One foot is much shorter than the other. And I asked her if she wanted to be prayed for because I told her you were here. And she said, no, I don't ever want to be prayed for again. Uh, and she said, well, why? And she said, because there was a, another preacher that came into town. They brought her in for prayer. He put her up on the stage, made a big show out of it and actually started doing stuff, you know, pulling on her and everything, and actually hurt her, and made a show. She started crying, nothing happened, nothing changed, and she was totally embarrassed. And this woman said, if I can get her to come, would you pray for her? And I said, well, yeah, of course. And she said, well, if she comes, she, she's, does it have to be a show type? I said, no, no, no. I said, look, I said, you bring her in here. Let me know when she's here. If we can go in this other room and do it. Now, I just told you don't do it you know, hidden off somewhere. But you have to, to work with people. You have to help people and not make a show out of them. All right? And so I said, we can go off over here somewhere and pray, and that's okay, and it doesn't matter. And I said, just bring her in, and, and if she'll let me, let me minister to her, then I'll do it. So this woman said, okay, you know, Brother Curry's different. He's not going to hurt you, and all this, so just give him a chance. So they brought her in, <clears throat> and it was toward the back of the room. And I even asked the little girl, I said, you know, can I pray for you? And she said, okay. And a real sweet little girl, and she said, I said, do you want to go over here in this other room, or you want to pray here, or what do you want to do? And she said, well, here's okay. Well, it's funny, because when we started, nobody noticed what was going on. As soon as we started, everybody gathered around. And she started looking around, and I, I thought, okay, we, we may end up having to go to the other room. But it was funny, because whenever I, I, I said, well, let's, if you'll sit down, I said, I'm not going to do anything to hurt you or anything. I just want to check and see what we're doing here. I said, so just, if you will, put your feet up. She, I had her sit down, put her feet up. And literally, we get, as far as I know, a 100% success rate in scoliosis and, you know, legs and shortened legs and that kind of stuff. And so, I had to sit down, put her feet up, and they were like that. And I said, all right. And I was, you know, showing everybody that was there. I said, well, do you see this? I said, do you see that? And the mother, or the uh, aunt was looking at her. And I said, all right. I said, real simple. I said, watch it. And I just put her feet on my chest. Just at the minute, I said, in the name of Jesus, work. And I just kind of moved just a little bit. I, I, and you say, why do you do all that? It's just to give it a, a chance. You know what I mean? Just to kind of get it. I wasn't pulling on her legs. Or, it wasn't any of that. Generally, all I ever do is I will hold the ankles so that I can see the difference. And then I'll just move it back and forth. Just that. And as I move it, it does that. And then you look down. Oh, there it is. 
And I said, how's that? Many times, well, I've seen them go from here this way. I mean, longer, literally longer, and then go back. And so, <clears throat> a lot of times, that's so the, the people can actually see it. And they watch it. And so, now, it's, it's kind of like any time anybody asks me this, it's like, okay, go ahead, you know, if y'all want to see this, watch, because it's going to happen. And so, okay, you would call that a gift. Like, remember I was talking earlier? It's just, it's like, oh yeah, here, watch. Boom. I mean, there's not even a, a thought. There's not even a, a hesitation, right? And so we just do that. And when I did it, I said, all right. And her shoes had lifts in them because one foot was so much shorter than the other. And so we took the shoes off. I said, all right, stand up, move around, see how that is. And she started moving around. And the first thing that came out of her mouth is, I got to go buy me some new shoes. First thing. And so we took the shoes and the little girl walked out of there carrying the shoes, perfectly healed, back straight, scoliosis gone, right? And no pain, no embarrassment. I mean, it was the way it's supposed to be, you know? See, here's the problem. As long as you make healing an event, it's never going to be natural to you. See, we make it an event. It's a big deal. Ta-da! You know, it's a big show. It's got to be normal. It's got to be, this is, this is normal. You know, healing is normal. And when you start understanding that it's normal, and it's supposed to be a part of your everyday life, then you don't make big deals out of it. You know, and, and I'm not playing it down. I'm not belittling it. Because when people get healed, to them, many times it is a big deal. But we can't make an event. See, that's what we do a lot of times. Even the healing services. All right, we're good. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> getting back into John, remember this, that as he's, because I want to read it to you the way, if you read it in the Greek, this is the way it reads. All right? So, our problem is we read according to the punctuation that we have instead of reading the way it says it. Okay? Because the way it says it, it's pretty simple. Starting in verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither is this man's sin, nor his parents, but that... The, now watch, because, again, punctuation messes you up, kind of... But watch, he says, But that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me. And you hear the difference in the way that's written? Now, if you read it according to the punctuation, which is not divine, then it makes it sound like Jesus is saying, God made him this way so that I could come by in healing so God can get glory. Right? Now, in India... They will take their children and break their legs when they're born. Because there are no jobs to be had. So if they break their legs, then they can put them on the side of the road and they'll, they'll be beggars. And they will make more money begging than if they are healthy physically and can't find a job. Alright? Now, see, just the reaction you had to that, and you want to accuse God of that? Now think about that. We accuse God of doing what we would put men in jail for. You understand? That makes God guilty of child abuse. All right? This is the man who gave his son for people who hated him. Right? And you think he's so egotistical that he wants to have, have somebody born blind all his life just for the day when Jesus would walk by and heal him so then everybody go, Oh, look. You see? Because if I'm standing there and Jesus says, yeah, he was born blind so I can heal him. Okay, the healing isn't going to be near as impressive to me when I say, well, if you made him this way, now you're going to heal him. You're just egotistical tyrant. You see what I'm saying? That's not the God who sent his son Jesus. So if you read it according to the punctuation, you get a wrong, well, according to the punctuation and according to the way it has been preached. Which, remember comes from a wrong concept of God anyway. Alright? Now, he says, if you go on down, now you have to remember this whole story here, because when the man gets healed, the first thing the Pharisees start doing is questioning him, and saying, who did this? And he said, well, I don't know who did it exactly, but all I know is I was blind, and now I see. And they're saying, well, we know the man that healed you, and, and he's a sinner. And he said, well, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, all I know is I was blind, and now I see. And so they go on and on, and watch this. Because I want to I bring out some points. I keep standing on this. He says, um, <clears throat> yeah, go down to verse, let's go down to verse 8. 
The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, Well, this is he. Others said, Well, he is like him. But the man said, I am he. In other words, I'm telling you, I was the one that was blind. <clears throat> but they weren't sure. And therefore said they unto him, How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man that's called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes. Now notice, anointed his eyes there meant just, you know, he didn't put power into his eyes. Okay? He put clay on his eyes. Okay? And, and made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And, and I went and washed and I received sight. Now you notice he didn't receive sight when Jesus put it on his eyes. He received sight after he had gone and washed. Okay? Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man that was before then blind. And it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Uh-oh. <laughs> then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, He put clay on my eyes and I washed and I do see. So they keep drilling him, right? And when somebody keeps asking you the same question, they're wanting a different answer than you're given. All right? Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God because he keeps not the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man that's a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. So now they're going to deny he was even blind. And received his sight. Until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. So, okay, we're going to make sure that we're going to call your parents and see if you were really blind. And they asked him, saying, Is your son, who you say was born blind, is this your son, whom you say was born blind, then how does he now see? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son, and we know that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we don't know. Or who has opened his eyes, we don't know. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Now, these words spoke his parents because they feared the Jews. They knew. But they didn't want to answer. They said, oh, well, look, we know it's their son. We know he's blind. But he's old enough. Ask him. Don't ask us. Because here it said, the Jews had already agreed that if any man did confess that he was a Christ, that he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he's of age. Ask him. In other words, we don't want to get kicked out of church. Ask him. You know, well, he was our son. He was born blind. That's as far as we're willing to say. We want to keep our good standing in church, so ask him and let him get kicked out. Right? Isn't, I mean, isn't that what's going on? <clears throat> See, the Bible's amazing if you just read it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then again, called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. Yeah, he just keeps saying the same thing over and over again. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How did he open your eyes? And he, now you can tell he's getting kind of tired of this. He says, I have told you already and you didn't hear. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciples too? Yeah, he's getting kind of uh, uppity with them as we say, right? He's starting to kind of get smarty with them. Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. Now, stop right there. That verse is what I want to get to because that's the next part we've got to move into. You, now, it is clear here that there are two groups. There are people who are Jesus' disciple and people who are Moses' disciple. All right? Now, this didn't stop whenever Jesus died. Right? We know all through Acts, the same thing was still going on. The Pharisees and the Judaizers, they were still causing Paul problems and all these situations. Now, what you're going to have to decide, I, and I mean this very literally, and, and this is probably the most, one of the most important statements I will make during this, during these, uh, this seminar, and I, and I can't be more serious about it, that what you've got to do is you're going to make, have to make a decision. You're going to have to decide if you're going to be Jesus' disciple or Moses' disciple. You understand? You can't be both. Right? Now, what, well, the reason I say that is because of this. I wanna, I'll read this scripture. No, I'll read this to you. I had a question here. Yeah. 
Since sickness is not from God, how do I explain the following scriptures to Christians who argue otherwise? That they say God sends it. Okay. <clears throat> Someone asked me about these in Isaiah 30, 26. It says, The moon will be as bright as the sun, and the sun will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven days in one. So it will be when the Lord begins to heal his people and cure the wounds he gave them. And they're saying, see what they're saying? Well, see, the wounds he gave them. And, and actually, this is talking about a, a future time period, okay? Which we know God is already healing. He's healed all, all along. So, obviously, when it says wounds he's healed, he's talking... If you go in and read this whole chapter, this whole area, it is talking about a future time. And the, the words for wounds and cure and heal and all that are, as we would say, metaphorical. It's not wounds, literally. He's saying he will cause the Jewish people to return to him and not be divided from him as they were whenever Jesus came. All right? Real simple. So you just have to go and look at the whole context and everything. Now, <clears throat> then in, in first, on the back of that, 1 Corinthians 11, and we're going to go into that when we get into healing and the atonement. But you have to understand this. Under the Old Covenant, matter of fact, go with me in your manual. <laughs> See, you actually get to use the manual today. <laughs> you can go to uh, chapter 2, which is page 7. And this, this is the most important aspect of the seminar. Okay? And it's pretty much what we will be doing from now on, even though we're going to hit different topics. But if you don't get this, I promise you, you will revert back to the old way of doing things that doesn't work. Okay? If you get a hold of this, then everything changes. <clears throat> in, um, and if you don't have a manual, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's where we're going to go to next if I can get over there. Yep, there we go. Now, <clears throat> under the old covenant, man was under sin... And we know, and you kind of have to get the whole, and I wish I had a kind of a timeline thing behind me because you could see how God dealt with people. God initiated a covenant through a man named Abraham. Okay? Now, the covenant, and I will show you all these scriptures later on. I'm just giving you a paraphrase overview. The covenant that God initiated with Abraham wasn't made with Abraham. Okay? It was made with Jesus. But God didn't want to wait until Jesus came to make it because that would mean everybody before that would be excluded and could not be helped. Okay? Just really trying to make this real just simple. I could get a lot more theological, but then we'd be here, you know, an extra two or three days. Okay? Now, because God used Abraham because he was a man at that time and Jesus was going to be in the lineage of Abraham, then God used Abraham and counted it unto righteousness because Abraham believed God and made the covenant with him and agreed to do it. Okay? Now, yeah. not getting into Isaac and all that kind of stuff because that's a lot of typology that is true and real, but we don't have time for it. <clears throat> then, because of this, throughout God started initiating a relationship with man. <clears throat> but over time, God... Through the Old Covenant, God did not get to deal with man the way he wanted to because of sin. Right? Sin kept God from having the relationship with man that he wanted. Now, whenever, because of that, later, 430 years later roughly, the, um, Moses came along and God gave Moses the law. Now, the law, you have to understand, God made the covenant with Jesus. Through Abraham, right? But the law came after that and was, as we would say, be like in parentheses. Okay? The law was a time period in parentheses. Okay? Inside of this. And the law was added. Again, you'll see all this in Scripture. The law was added because of transgression. And where there's transgression, when you sin, then there had to be a curse because of the broken law. Now... <clears throat> We'll get into the rest of it later. But the, the best part of this is that we know that Jesus became a curse for us. Remember that part. Now, in the New Covenant, God gets to deal with man the way he wants to. Right? Under the Old Covenant, God couldn't deal with man because of his sin. 
under the new covenant, sin is dealt with, so now God can treat man the way he wants to. All right, now, uh, let me give you some scriptures, and you're already in 1 Corinthians 2. Let me go here real quick. Now, matter of fact, you may turn these other scriptures. You don't have to turn these other scriptures, but you can if you want to. In Matthew 26, verse 26, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Verse 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, or New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, notice, Matthew has how many chapters? 28 chapters. Now, where is this at? 26, okay? Now watch. He said, this is the new covenant. Isn't that right? And then it was in chapter 26, going into 27, when he was crucified. And then after that, talks about his raising, right? Now, Mark 14, starting in verse 23. says, and he took the cup when he gave thanks, when he'd given thanks. He gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Same situation, right? Notice it's in Mark 14. How many chapters in Mark? 16. So it's two chapters before the end, right? Both times. Now, Luke 22, verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, break it, gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament, New Covenant, in my blood, which is shed for you. Right? Chapter 22, how many chapters in Luke? 24. So you'll notice, every time this holds true, when it talks about the, the Lord's Supper, every time he mentions the New Covenant, and says, this is the New Covenant. In other words, he's saying, this is the beginning of the ratification or the initiation of the New Covenant. And then what he's saying? This is a new covenant in my blood. Now, it was, they were all started two chapters before the end of each book, right? And the reason I'm bringing that out is because of this. That means that from Matthew 26 forward, back 25, 24, all the way back, Matthew 14 forward and Luke 22 forward would not technically be considered new covenant. Right? Or as we would say, New Testament, technically. He was still operating under the Old Covenant. Isn't that right? The New Covenant... Te now, we know they started Matthew, Mark, you know, we go to Malachi, and then we go, it says the New Testament, and you come in. Technically, again, man put that sheet in there that said New Testament. Alright? <clears throat> the New Covenant technically did not start, nor did Jesus operate under a New Covenant... Now think about it, because he said, this is the new covenant of my blood, and then it was representative of his blood, and this is my body, eat it, and then he went and gave his body and his blood. Well, of course, he had to do the Lord's Supper before he, gave, before he died, of course. You know, duh, okay. <laughs> but he had to do that. So he was initiating the new covenant and saying, now I'm, this is my blood, this is my body, and he was referring to when he was going to be on the whipping post and on the cross. Now, on the, whipping, on the cross... His body wasn't broken. Matter of fact, they, they point out very specifically, nothing was broken. Amen. Isn't it right? So he said, this is my body which was broken for you. So when was it broken? Because, and, well, when we get into healing the atonement, technically, and we look at 1 Corinthians 11, where he said that, uh, where Paul quoted him, it is very clear what's going on because he said, this is my body broken for you. Now, in the times past, we have said, well, that refers to the church. And he's talking about the church. Okay. When was the church ever broken for you? Right? That's not referring to the church. He, if, if that's referring to his actual blood, why don't we think when he says, my body's broken for you, why don't all of a sudden we go spiritual? Why don't we also recognize that as physical and say that's his body, physical body? Well, when was his physical body broken? Not on the cross, on the whipping post. And he said, by his stripes we're healed. He paid for your healing before he paid for your sins. You understand? And if you will notice, okay, first, uh, Psalm 103, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, right? And if you go through, you'll find out every time, it says, whenever he healed the sick, he said, your sins are forgiven, right? But he would also tell people, he'd say, well, he would set them free and the people would get upset. And he'd say, what, is it, what does it matter if I say you're healed or if I say your sins are forgiven? 
Why? Because they were both included in the same time period. Now, they're not the same thing because one was on the whipping post and one was on the cross. Jesus bore the stripes on the whipping post and he poured out his blood on the cross, right? He paid for your healing before he paid for your sins. Now, people say, well, yeah, but you know, salvation is more important than healing. Okay, well, that, that's true to a well person. Right? But ask a sick person, okay? They want to get well. Now, understand, in eternity, obviously, salvation is more important than just being healed. Right? Obviously. But the funny thing is, people say, well, yeah, but this is more important than that. Okay, who told you to divide them? Who, what makes you think, why, why would you even say this is more important? What does it matter? They're both paid for. Right? Okay, someone wants to give you a gold watch or a diamond ring, they have them both there and go, here's this, I paid for both of them. Now you're going to go, um, I'll, I'll take that one. No, you're going to say, thank you. And then, right, you're going to take both, right? What makes you think you've got to choose? See, we always say, well, yeah, but salvation is more important. Okay, are you hearing voices? Because I didn't ask you which was more important. You understand? Or why do you think we have to talk about what's more important? Right? Both were paid for. Jesus gave his life for both. Who are you to say, well, healing doesn't count? It would have counted if you'd have been standing next to the whipping post and seen that blood splatter on you as he was whipped and torn apart. Maybe then it would be more real to you. But see, we don't get that picture most of the time. That's why I thank God for Passion of the Christ Mel Gibson did. That was the most realistic representation of what actually took place. All right? You know, it, like I said, it's amazing who God can use. Amen? <laughs> hey. There's been amazing things, all right? And, and I could give you other stories even more so that would just, you know, strange things, okay, of how God can use people. Now, I want to bring that up because I want to get you over here to realize, <clears throat> again, well, I have to bring this in. We're talking about when the new covenant came into play, all right? So that means that everything Jesus did, now, now listen carefully because you have to understand this. Remember I told you from the beginning, if you are going to, um, if you read any story in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, you will identify with one of those people. Right? The sick, the disciples, or Jesus. And the only person you can identify with is Jesus. He's the only person like you. You're a new creation. He was the last Adam. You understand? He, the first Adam, earthly. Second Adam, or last Adam, is heavenly. Right? You are born of heaven, not of the earth, now, because you are born again. A new creation. You understand? So you identify with the second and the last Adam, not the first Adam. Amen? You cannot identify with the sick person or with the disciples at that point. Okay? Now, the reason I say this, because now I have to take you to 2 Corinthians. Actually, I told you to go to 1 Corinthians. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians first. I'm going to read some scriptures to you because I'm laying this groundwork because you've got to get this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting in verse 1. He says, do, Paul, of course, writing to the Corinthians, <clears throat> do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? Or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle. You hear he's saying people are epistles. Okay? You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly table or fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ toward God or to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Okay? Now, I'm reading all this down because I want you to get the whole context of it. Who also, now who, God, has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Who made us able ministers? God did it. So it was God's part, not something you did. Right? Of the New Testament or New Covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now see, that's what the Pharisees did more interested in making sure you did it their way as opposed to making sure that people got help. Okay? But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel, it's talking about the Old Covenant, 
so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Now you hear that? Moses operated under the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant had a glory. The children of Israel couldn't even look on Moses' face because of the glory from the Old Covenant. And if that glory was going to be washed or done away with, right? How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be more glorious? Hear that? The New Covenant is greater than the Old Covenant. Now, if the New Covenant wasn't greater than the Old Covenant, then the New Covenant wouldn't have replaced the Old Covenant. You understand? Now, this is what messes Christians up. It is when you try to make the Old Covenant and the New Covenant work together. You understand? You can't do it. Okay? One, that's why one's called old, one's called new. Okay? They do not work together. That's why people say, well, I don't understand it. Um, you know, the God under the Old Covenant isn't the God under the New. No, same God, just different people. God couldn't deal with them under the Old Covenant the way He can under the New. When the people change, God can change. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Now, what, what I mean by change, obviously, is God's always the same. Nothing's changed with God except how He can deal with us. Okay? Matter of fact, Scriptures even says that God has not dealt with us according to our sins. Isn't that amazing? And yet that's exactly what most healing camps teach. You know, okay? Uh, generational curse, um, whatever. Now, you, you say you don't believe in generation? No. Gen are there genetic diseases? Yes. Yes, there are. But that's not a generational curse the way it's taught by religious people. Okay? That is the result of sin on the earth. The sin principle in the earth, which caught... See, again, this is what proves evolution is just garbage. Okay? I don't... Everything's running down. Not getting better. Okay? The fact that there are genetic diseases that get worse proves that we're not evolving up. Alright? If we're evolving... If anything, you know, we're getting dumber. Okay? Now, the more knowledge, but people are stupider than they used to be. Okay? <laughs> okay? Don't ask me to explain that because <laughs> Dr. Simra went into um, England and he went to the Museum of Natural History. And they have displays there. Actually, you can still go there today and see it. They have displays that shows that in when Abraham was in Ur of the Chaldees, they had hot and cold running water in their houses. All right? There were, what you see from the fall of man. Man was brilliant. Adam was brilliant. I mean, he named all the animals. Okay? So he's pretty smart. He had use of a lot of brain. But over time, men get dumber. Okay? By the time of Abraham and Ur of the Chaldees, they still had done great things. Okay, still can't explain the pyramids. Right? You understand? Men did that. And they don't know how they did it exactly. They have had different ideas. They've tried to prove it. But still, they can't prove it yet. But they had hot and cold running water. They had... Uh, conveniences, they had hot baths, they had steam underground that would cause you know, you know uh, large baths basically. And yet what we see is men's intelligence declining over years and then we see knowledge start coming in to where knowledge increased but men's wisdom hasn't. Right? In the beginning men had wisdom and they used knowledge. But over time, men's wisdom has decreased while knowledge, meaning information, has increased. You understand? <clears throat> now, so that shows the decline. Anyway, now it says here, uh, verse 9, For at the ministration of condemnation, the old covenant, be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness, new covenant, exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. In other words, when you compare the old and the new, the old had no glory compared to the new. Okay? <clears throat> he says, For if that which is done away, hear that? That which is done away. Paul wrote this to the Corinthians after Jesus was resurrected, after the new covenant was put in place. And he says, For if that which was done away was glorious, again, past tense, was glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. So he is contrasting the two covenants. Seeing then we have such hope, 
We use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, showing that we're talking about the Old Covenant, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. You hear that? To the end of that which is abolished. In other words, even though Moses had put a veil on his face, as glorious as that was, that was done away. He says, but their minds were blinded. For, now listen to this. For until this day remains the same veil. Now this is after Jesus' resurrection. Untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Hear that? To this day, if you read the Old Testament, there's a veil over your face that does not allow you to see the glory that's in the New Covenant. But where do we spend most of our time preaching from in the church? Old Testament. So you're being, I don't want to say blinded, but you're, you're putting the veil on and it's keeping you from seeing the glory which is in Christ in the new covenant. Now, he says, which veil is done away in Christ? Now, isn't that funny? We go back to read things that says puts a veil on us rather than read letters written to us that says takes away the veil. Isn't that right? And most people spend no time in the epistles. See, the gospels tell who Jesus was and what he went through physically. Not a whole lot of what he went through spiritually. Acts shows what the apostles did with it. From Romans on, it's letters to us to tell us what Jesus did in us, for us, and will do through us. You understand? The old covenant was... Okay, listen carefully. Jesus, when I first read this, I, it was hard to believe. But since Jesus said it, you got to believe it. Right? I mean, you, it's no choice. you just got to believe it. He said, of all the prophets born of women, there has not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. And I thought, when I read that part, I thought, okay, just stop right there. Because when I read something like that that just stands out, I just stop. And I said, okay, God, you're going to have to explain this because automatically I would reject that. Because John, how was he a greater prophet? He did no miracles. He didn't call fire down from heaven. He, he, he didn't do twice the miracles of Elijah. He didn't part the Red Sea. Come on, how could he be a greater prophet? And then God took me right to that part where he said he was a greater prophet. I thought, okay. And, I, and then God said, what is a prophet? I said, well, it's somebody that has a message from God. He said, so what I said was, not John did greater miracles. John had a greater message than the Old Testament prophets. And I thought, okay, then what was that? Because, and I started looking at it because all the Old Testament prophets had the same message. Every one of them. They all said the same thing. He's coming. He's coming. You go through every book of the Old, every prophet, all, every one of them mentioned the Messiah. And said, He's coming. And in that day, and in that day, and when he comes, and in that day, when this... And I'm thinking, okay. And then John. John is... The, remember, Old Testament. John's still in the Old Testament. You know what I'm you know, saying? In the God, he was still an Old Testament prophet. Why? Because the New Covenant hadn't started until the, after John was dead. Two, two chapters before the end. Right? But then Jesus shows up, and John is the first prophet with a different message. All the other prophets... He's coming. John says, he's here. Isn't that right? That made him the best prophet. Why? He had a better message. Isn't that right? He did no miracles, so he couldn't be a better prophet because of miracles. He was a better prophet because of a better message. Now, then I kept, I said, okay, I understand that, God. So I went on and kept reading. Then Jesus says something that even made it hard to believe because he said, nevertheless, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Okay, that I had a real problem with because when he said least in the kingdom, then I'm somewhere in the kingdom. And if he said least, then that, he's talking about me. Right? So he just said that anybody in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Which meant John wasn't in the kingdom. Right? Which means none of them at that time were in the kingdom. Right? So... But he said, he that's least in the kingdom is greater than John. And I thought, okay, wait a minute. Okay, John was the greater prophet because he had a different message. They said he's coming. John said he's here. Now, how can I be greater 
And then I realized it. It's because even the least in the kingdom of God. Now, do you realize when John, remember he saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Right? And then he went down the water, and he came out, dove came down, and Jesus did what? Went off into the wilderness. Right? So John, see, they say, he's coming. John says, he's here. But then John had to say, there he goes. Isn't that right? But he that's least in the kingdom, if you're in the kingdom, you can never say, there goes Jesus, because I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will abide in you. I will li See, that's what makes us greater. They, they said he's coming. John said, there he goes. And we're saying, he abides in me. He lives in me. Christ who lives in me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see the difference? That's what makes the least in the kingdom greater than John the Baptist. That's what makes you better than Elijah, Elisha, Moses. I don't care who you are. It's because of who is in you that makes you different. It, that's the difference between the old and the new covenant. The old covenant saints, see that's in Hebrews it says that they without you could not be made perfect. The Old Testament, this is what's amazing. Old Testament saints were looking, even Jesus said, he said, Abraham looked forward to this day. He wanted to see my day. Isn't it right? And it says that they, the Old Testament saints, without us, the New Testament saints, could not be made perfect. But it does not say that us, the New Testament saints, without them, couldn't be made perfect. Why? Because we were made complete and perfect in Christ. We're not looking back. Why is it that they were looking forward to our day. Without us, they couldn't be made perfect. But yet, we were made perfect in Christ. And yet still, we're always going back to the Old Testament and trying to find out how to live like Elijah. <laughs> Elijah wanted to live like you. Elijah looked forward to the day that when the Spirit of God would abide in him and not just come upon him. See, that's the difference. The Old Covenant and God moved upon Samson at times. And he moved upon the saints at times. But see, that's the problem. We want to live like Old Testament saints. Oh God, if God, you'll just move on me again. God says, I've been moving you every day and you ain't moving with me. Well, I'm just waiting on you, God. He goes, you ain't waiting on me. I'm waiting on you. Amen. Why? Because he abides in you. He said, now listen to this. In Corinthians, he says, if you will come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing, and I will walk in you and talk in you and I will be your God and you will be my people. He didn't say, I'll come upon you. He said, I will walk in you and talk in you. He said, I will abide in you. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you will. He said, I'm not worried about what you ask. Why? Because my words abide in you. You'll ask the right thing. You will ask according to his will. And his will doesn't change from second to second. His will is right here in this book. And you can find out what his will is. Jesus is the will of God. Jesus is perfect theology. You look at his life, it's perfect theology. That means heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, set the captives free, preach the gospel to every person, heal them all. As we, when I was in the military, we used to say, kill them all, let God sort them out. Remember that? I got a new one now. It's heal them all, let God sort it out. Amen? And just go after it. Amen? And people say, well, what if I heal the wrong person? Don't worry about that. Okay? Let, let God get on to you when you get to heaven. Amen? If that happens, it's not going to happen. Amen? Now, watch. He says, uh, yeah, but even on this day, verse 15, when Moses read the veils upon their face, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the, and that means a mirror. Remember that. When it says glass in the Bible, it's almost always meaning mirror. Okay? Behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Now, isn't it, you hear what I'm saying? We look as if we're looking into a mirror and we see the glory of the Lord. Well, if you're looking in a mirror and you're seeing the glory of the Lord, who's the glory of the Lord look like? Okay. <clears throat> but we all, with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen? Now, <clears throat> go to... Yes, quickly here. We're going to... Break in a minute. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 11. <laughs> Hebrews.
Hebrews 7, verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Now he's, he's trying to... All of Hebrews and Galatians really was written to contrast the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the ministry of Moses and the ministry of Jesus, and how much greater Jesus' covenant and Jesus' ministry was than the Old Covenant and the Moses. And so he's saying, look, if perfection came from the law, then why did we need Jesus? Why did we need another prophet? Why do we need another high priest coming along? In other words, he's trying to say, look, think for a minute. If God sent someone after the law then it was to be better and it meant that the law was going to be set aside. See, but our problem is we got people want to go back under the law. And now, okay, because people keep running out of stuff to preach, especially on TBN, <laughs> okay, <laughs> because of that, then they, they have to keep going in there and finding, they, every time they have to find something stronger. Because everything you preach, people will develop a skin thickness against that. And to move them, next time you have to preach something stronger or harder to get through to them. You understand? Because you will develop a callousness to it. So when they preach stuff to you and they have used every manipulative technique to get money from you, then they have to find a stronger way to do it next time. Alright? To break through to keep you given. Alright? Because TV time is expensive. Alright? Now, so to do that, at first, it was for you to get blessed. Give so you can get blessed, which is true. I told you yesterday, sowing and reaping works. Alright? It is true. You give and you get blessed. If you, and they talk about, well, give.